Welcome to another episode of Plastic Surgery Uncensored. I'm your host, Dr. Roddy Raban. And on this week's episode, I am finally, <laughs> finally joined by Sally Chankla Chacon. Who is Sally Chankla Chacon? Sally Chankla Chacon is my right hand, left hand, office manager, coordinator, extraordinaire, who's been with me for, yes, yeah, 16 years. I have been begging her to join me on the podcast, but she refuses because she doesn't have her hair, makeup, her glam squad, her this, that, the other. Not to after excuse. And yes, she is here. So you're going to want to pay attention this week as tables are turned. So we felt that it would be awesome for Sally to come on the show. And seeing that Sally knows our practice better than anyone with the exception of myself we thought it'd be interesting for sally to be on and ask me questions regarding our practice perhaps many of the things that patients have said to her inquired from her asked of her because what normally happens is i see the patients and then i'm done seeing the patients the patients then go into the room with sally and then a whole new perspective arises because, of course, they're in secrecy with Sally, and Sally is sweet and kind and inviting and, and all that good stuff. So, welcome to the show, Sally. Thank you, Dr. Ravon. So good all to right. be here. Super excited. Okay. Well, the Glam Squad did a good job. For those of you Thanks. listening, Sally <laughs> looks fantastic. Um, where does Chancla come from? Chancla is Spanish for flip-flop. And... Uh, that's it's just your my, favorite word. It's one of my favorite words in Spanish because I just love the way it sounds. It's like chancla. And it's <laughs> and in the and in the Latino culture, when your mom's pissed at you, she throws a chancla at your head. That's right. So uh anyway, right. just some fun facts. So Sally, um you've been working with me now for a total of sixteen years. Sixteen years. That's when I'm at seventeen. Going on to 17, I've actually been in practice now. Let me do the math. So I think you joined me like a, a year, a, no, two years after I went into practice. So correct. essentially I've been in practice 18 years and Sally joined me two years afterwards um, and has been with me um, essentially from the beginning. And for those of you who don't know, um, most practices are built from scratch. Some people finish in residency and they go out and they have a lot of family money or they join something big and everything's set up. But for me, at least, it was the old fashioned go hang your shingle. Literally, it was me, then me and a secretary, then me and a secretary and a coordinator, then me, a secretary, coordinator, and MA, and so on and so forth. So when I started, Obviously, I wasn't busy because no one knew who the hell I was. And so I had just a receptionist. I didn't really need anything else. It was like four calls a week. <laughs> and Sally was originally at that position way back when. And since then, has done every single position in the office. Receptionist, front office, back office, billing, MA, coordinator, office manager, HR, you name it. And so naturally she is befitting to run the practice by my side. Um, so that's our connection. That's our history. And uh, yeah. So Sally, um, I think it's interesting because you get asked a lot of fascinating questions because people are curious. Absolutely. Right. Curious about me. And mostly, most doctors, your office managers get the questions, right? right. Um, you know, and so I thought this was really interesting because over the last eight, you know, 16 years, you've been asked a lot of interesting questions that people All are right. wondering. Absolutely. And uh, let's do it. <laughs> what do you got for me? I'm ready. I got my sleeve How rolled up. I'm ready to answer questions. How about let's start with the funny, fun ones about when... Uh you were single and after the consult, first question asked, is Dr. Boston single or are you dating Dr. Ravon or what's his status? 
<laughs> yeah. So everybody was always wondering if I were either gay, which had been perfectly fine, but I wasn't. Right. What was wrong with me? Like, I don't get it. Wait, what do you mean he's not married? Or, oh, you guys must be an item, which is, Correct. I don't know. I guess every other plastic surgeon is dating their office manager. So, um, no, I was just picky and particular and and stubborn and waiting. I didn't find the wife. one. I didn't yeah. find the one. I didn't yeah, I'm wait, wife. <laughs> waiting to meet my wife, all of it, 44 years old. So, yeah, I mean, I don't, I, you know, it's interesting. There is a phenomenon of doctors and patients and this is actually why dating your patients are considered taboo or off limits Correct. it's because as a physician you have a position of authority and patients are vulnerable and there's Correct. an immediate like i think they have a certain connection of like you are in an intimate setting with them so i think they feel a certain connection yeah, I mean, it's also that, but like they tell you things they don't tell everybody else. They're coming to you for help. You right. automatically are kind to them because they're your patient. And so it's a lot of the information is confusing. So it's not uncommon for patients to, I don't know, maybe have a crush on their doctors or their professors. Correct. Or anyone that's in their lives that are sort of in a in a position of authority or above them. And it's, you know, it's it's a... It's a very slippery slope and you should be very careful. It was never the case for me, but nonetheless, that yeah, that that that's that didn't happen. That happened often while I was single. So Yeah. We had to keep a few patients away. But yeah, well, <laughs> that's for another day. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Um I I think that uh that you've been very professional about it. You're you're amazing you generally care for the patients so i think that's why they take it to that you know to a different level but um i think patient care for you is number one and to make them feel comfortable um and open up to you i mean they're coming in for a lot of insecurities also so um and help you know and i think you're amazing at that i think um that also sets certain expectations um as far as what they're looking for and what they want to accomplish when they come to see you um, I know you don't like using the word perfect because that's as an expectation of what's perfect for them versus, you know, what's perfect for you, which you don't, I don't know how to explain, but you don't like to use. No, I mean, if what happens is, well, so people come to plastic surgeons. I don't, I am very dogmatic about the language that's used during the consult. Correct. Most doctors are very casual. The conversation's had. As long as a patient feels confident that the doctor sort of gets them, they call it a day. I'm not that way. Correct. And I am very particular about the words that are used during the consults because those words have meaning. And many patients come to plastic surgeons looking for specific outcomes and terms that are unattainable. Correct. So the word natural is unattainable because there's no meaning to natural. There are people who look very unnatural to me and they think they look natural, so it is very subjective. The word symmetrical is ridiculous. There is no such thing in human anatomy. Every eye, every ear, every tooth, every nostril, every nipple, everything is asymmetric. Correct. I hate the word, you know, balance, you know, or, or harmonious or all this fluff. And I am very reluctant to allow the patients to describe what they're trying to accomplish that way because then what happens is that I give them the sense that that's doable. So instead of just glossing over it, so I'm looking for something, you know, my nose is a little crooked and I want it to be straight, not straighter, straight. And I want it to look natural and, you know, just like it belongs to me and like I've never had surgery, but then, you know, like I did. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. That's not even possible. Where's maybe another person be like, okay, got it. Um, I just don't want to be held. I don't want people to be misled, right? right? I don't want to do their surgery, do my very best, give them 110 percent. Then they come back. Their nose is obviously not symmetrical, right? Because we know right. that. And then they're like, wait, what happened? My nose is crooked. Now, I'm not talking about grossly crooked. I'm talking about like whatever, 5%, 10%. And then they're like, you told me it'd be symmetrical. 
And then now we're in this pissing match about, yes, I did. No, I didn't. So yes, I am very particular about the verbiage that I use in the consult, which is tiring at the time of the consult, but very, very um, Important. liberating because I think it sets better expectations and hopefully for happier patients. Absolutely. Realistic expectations. Yeah, too. Realistic. Exactly. Yeah, because remember, after surgery, all uh, that they're doing is staring in the mirror, you know, or looking at themselves and dissecting themselves even yeah. more because now you've actually done something. Yeah, yeah. They have so, a whole microscope glass, uh, you know, magnifying glass business going on. Absolutely. I'm glad you clarified that. That's that's something that patients, you know, always ask as far as expectations, what they can expect. They love that you are so realistic and, and give them a very realistic and direct approach, even though sometimes it may sound like you're in a rush, but you have so much information to give them and you have, you know, even though we give you up to that hour to do the consult, it's just, you want to make sure you just want to vomit all this information and give it to them so they can, you know, go home and make an informed decision. And, or if they go to other consults, which you always recommend, um, they can, you know, take that knowledge with them. They learn something. So. I think yeah, that's people listen everybody has a personality I'm looking at my one-year-old son and he's got a personality <laughs> and when he becomes whatever he is lawyer doctor dentist artist musician barista he'll have that personality present at that time I'm a particular person and I have a sort of a moral obligation internally to make sure that I do whatever I can to optimize the information the patients are getting. So again, normally a consult is 20, 30 minutes. If I had to just generally, just generally breeze over a mommy mako, a facelift, breeze over a rhinoplasty, I could do it with greatest of ease in 20 minutes. However, you would leave knowing nothing, nothing at all. It would be complete and utter shit. It would be flying. Then Conversely, I can give you a shit ton of information and I have to cram it in, in, you know, about an hour, which is already twice as long as anybody else is taking. Nobody else has time to spend an hour. You go see your doctor. You see him for like eight minutes. You're not even seen by your doctor. First, you're seen by the PA, then the MA, then the, the. So I have this heavy responsibility and load of, of, of offloading a dictionary of information, which I feel you need in a finite amount of time. And so, of course, I'm going to sound as if I'm in a rush. But as a result, because patients are sometimes like, you'll say, how did it go? And you're like, it was great. It was just, wow, so much information. I felt kind of rushed. As a result right. of that comment, we in instigated and implemented a timer. I have a damn timer in the room that I click in front of them so they know that when I walk out, I spend 49 minutes. Because when I would come out, after 49 minutes, no one in the universe spends 49 minutes with a patient today. If they come out and be like, I felt rushed, it's because I'm speaking quickly. Correct. And so now we're like, well, uh, not so quick. And they're still processing that you give them so much information. They're still trying to process it all. And they come in kind of like wide eyed into my office. Like that was great. And it's so much information, which is great. But yeah, they, you know, they'll comment. Oh, I felt rushed. Yeah. And listen, at the end of the day, we don't expect patients to walk into a consult, walk out of a consult and book surgery. That's unrealistic. Correct. I don't expect you to come back from the consult and walk to the back with you and be like, all right, what dates do you have? So right. yes, you are supposed to be overwhelmed with information because this is a big ass decision. Then you take, then you take this information, you go home, you listen to a couple of podcasts, watch a few YouTubes, go to a few more consults, and then it settles in. Correct. And then you make a life altering decision informed. Not pseudo informed, not kind of informed, not fake informed, not TikTok informed, but really informed. So, any rate, yes, we hear people often saying, "Wow, it was so." There's so much information. I felt overwhelmed, whatever. But I don't care because that's why people come to me because they know that they're going to get the truth and a lot of it. Correct. Right. 
Yeah, no, it, it definitely, it, I think most people, I mean, most of the patients come back and say, I appreciate it. It's just, it was, it's a lot of information that they have to process. So that's great. How do you feel when you have to deal with difficult patients? <laughs> I hate dealing with difficult people um, because as it is, as it is, what I do is difficult. I am analyzing a person, deciding to alter that person permanently surgically. Correct. Then I have all the pressure of that operation, all my own internal expectations, and then have to deal with all the biology and anatomy and healing of that person. And that process right there is very stressful. And I'd have yeah. and I don't even have the person's personality involved yet. Right. So if you take the process I just described, flying a fighter jet pilot at Mach 8 between two buildings, and then on top of it, you add bad personality to your co-pilot, it makes it a very miserable mission. So of course I hate dealing with road people, difficult people, unaware people, selfish people, entitled people. Yeah. That's not fun. I'm already walking in with a lot of pressure, right? Because I right. make my job seriously. Correct. And at the end of the day, I'm a human being, right? I'm a person, they're a person. There's always- Very sensitive, the, by the way. <laughs> I am a very sensitive person, of course. People are always surprised. Oh, he seems so tough and unfazed no. and insensitive and so direct. Too much, though. As a matter of fact, I give a shit way too much. Correct. And so obviously, I walk in there with a, the objective is, okay, I walk into every consult like, I'm going to do my best to do- right by this patient then right. you get in the way by being unpleasant demanding so you waited an extra 20 minutes and you're nasty as i walk in of course i don't want to take care of you so what would a regular human being do not your doctor not your teacher not your clergy not your police officer what would a human do a human would react i don't like taking care of difficult people because i'm I already have so much internal pressure. Correct. The last thing I want to do is add your BS to me. So as a result, I try not to operate on people. I'm like, we come out of the console and I'm like, she's difficult. He's crazy. And what is, why am I telling? I don't want to operate on them. Right. And then sure enough, Murphy's Law, they can't wait to book. <laughs> I actually go out of the consult go back to my coordinator sally and i say this person should not be operated on we're not a match and yeah. we have to figure out a way not to operate on them and even but even look when you've been direct sometimes with these patients like listen this is what you want this is what i can give you and you're very clear about it they still book yeah because i i, I think people are just people right yeah i mean i, I just don't i think there's all kinds of personalities Listen, sometimes people, people are having a bad day and we give that to them. And we've, had, had, some, days. we've yeah. had scenarios where people, sometimes our own patients, are not pleasant and we give them grace. But by and large, people who are not pleasant are not pleasant people. And I don't want to take care of them because right. I, I have the right of refusal. I don't need to operate on people that I don't like, because if everything goes great, we're good. Right. Even right. if I don't like you, I don't care. Good luck. Wish you the best. But if everything doesn't go well and we are now in a situation, now I am effed or right. screwed because you're a nasty person versus right. I'm you know, we, I'm so lucky that you're a sweet person and we can manage this process. So right. the reason I don't like operating on difficult people is because of the 1%, 2% likelihood that something won't go well, in which case I'm stuck with you. We're married. Right. I can't tell you to go away. Right. I can't refund you the money I operated on you. Right. And it's surgery and there's already complications and risks associated with it. So, you know, and some are in your control and some are just Part of the healing process or part of, you know, the patient developing certain issues that need to, you know, be followed and there's not, you know, you're doing your best to help them. And 
So I deal with difficult people by not dealing with them. Yeah. I try to hit to- them <laughs> and then I try to dodge them. You know what I mean? I go in there, I tell them what they came to get to here and yeah. then I try to figure out how to not operate them. No, totally. Um, and what would you say is like your biggest frustration with patients? That's a great question. I think the biggest frustration I have is when they come to you and I can I can't really blame them. I just mm-hmm. it's frustrating when you're telling someone what they need to know. Uh huh. Like, hey, I'm here for a breast dog. Okay, great. The mm-hmm. biggest breast dog you can have is a C cup because your anatomy doesn't fit. Here's the reasons: one, two, three, four, five. And then they're like, yeah, but my friend and I saw TikTok, and you're just like, wait, did you just not hear what I just said to you? So right. I get frustrated when you are telling some. Listen, it's not beneficial to me or, hey, you know what? And that is what you like. Correct. You, you need to lose 30 pounds. I don't think you're going to be happy. You're not going to be flat. Your belly's not going to be flat after I do a tummy check. And then they're like arguing with you about it. So right. my frustration is when you tell them the truth and you're righteous and it's not beneficial for you, but it's beneficial for them. For them. Right. You're telling them what is best for them, not best for you. Because what's best for every doctor is to make as much money as possible. Correct. That means operate on every idiot who walks through the door who's willing to operate. And accept a handful of them will be unhappy, but F it. You made a boatload of money. That's what's good for me. To put money aside for my son and his college fund. But that's not what I do. So when I don't do what other people do and do the righteous thing, and I'm telling you what you need to do, and then you look at me like, well, uh, well that's not what this guy, I was just like, are you kidding me right now? Right. So that's one of my frustrations. I can't stand people who come to a doctor's office and complain about waiting. It makes me bananas. Right. Because we tell you, you and cannot, I- you cannot have a delicious Thanksgiving dinner and not wait 12 hours for it to cook. Right. You want microwave speed? You get microwave taste. So right. you come to my practice, we tell you well in advance, bring a book, an iPad, I don't give a shit, sit, be patient, and when it is your turn, you will get his undivided attention. Absolutely. Just like he gave that to every other person before and after you, and it's medicine. Right. It's not a train. We're not arriving at 102, and if it's at 103, the train leaves. People have questions and concerns. So you come on yeah. practice and then you bitch and complain and you harass my staff. And you open and close the door. And then I come in and you're like, hi, I've been waiting a long time. I'm like, and, 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 and how can I help you? It's like, you came here. I didn't ask you to come. Right. That's actually that, that trumps the last one. I'm. <laughs> that takes number one. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. hate people who complain about shit they shouldn't be complaining about. Yeah. Well, because you take your time taking care of everyone. And yeah, what do you think I'm doing? Patient, I mean, you're seeing all your patients from. What, you, what, I'm, what do you think I'm doing? Right. We like see eight, patients, right. Pre op appointments. People are getting ready to have surgery, follow up appointments. We see you at your two weeks, at your six weeks. At it's your just crazy. It, there's no reason for it. My wife's had five spine surgeries. Yeah. Now, she has set hours in spine surgeon offices, says nothing in massive amount of pain. And is so respectful. And that's, and, and the doctor sees them, I swear to God, six minutes. Right. First person that sees them is the PA or the nurse practitioner. Right. They see them for seven minutes. Then they sit in the room for another 20 minutes. Mind you, most of these people are in pain. Then the spine right. surgeon comes in, sees them for three minutes, and then they leave. So they yeah. waited three hours in pain to be seen for six minutes. You sit in my office, in a beautiful office with nice music and good smelling, and you get seen for an hour. And you're complaining? Get out of here. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Why don't we take a quick break? Now you got me all agitated. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break. We'll come back. I'm sure you'll have some. We, people want to hear gossip, Sally. What's up? I know. Right? I told you, 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 you can ask me anything you want, and this is what you're asking me? <laughs> bullshit. All right. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with the second half of Plastic Surgery Uncensored. All right, welcome back to the second half of Plastic Surgery Uncensored. 
Uh, I'm joined by Sally Chunkler Chacon, aka my <laughs> office manager, extraordinaire, coordinator, whatever word she wants to be called, HR, etc. So we're gonna, I guess, Maria, our producer, really wants us to read um, an occasional um, review, which obviously I beg you at the end of every episode to write nice things, and so you wrote them, and so she wants us to read it. So Sally, um, read uh, us. The, would you also write the the what do you call it the um, title or the hashtag what do you call it handle yeah, the person it. and yeah. uh, write read if you can the lovely comment this uh, wonderful woman left for us yes yeah, so this patient wrote uh, t- the t- the title is anxiety free of surgery does she have a handle does it say like Susie yeah, yeah L three Miami L three Miami shout out to you. <laughs> By listening to Dr. Roddy Rabon's podcast, I felt much more uh, prepared with my list of questions for, for the consult. It even motivated me to come out of the pandemic hiding to get healthy again. I even started working out with a trainer to gain strength and muscle that I had lost. I wanted to be as strong as possible for my surgeries. Breast reduction and tummy tuck. As time got closer to my surgery date, I would start to feel anxious on and off, which is totally normal, by the way. <laughs> I would then go back to certain episodes, feel calm again. Shockingly, before my surgery, I was nervous. I was not nervous, was actually excited about it. No joke. My husband was nervous Nelly night before and morning of surgery. So that makes us feel good, right? Because right now, we're taking time off of our family time to put this podcast together. And the only purpose is for it to enable you and arm you with information to make your journey Better. So that's fantastic. All right. So the second half of our podcast is going to be dedicated to a little bit more gossip related <laughs> or inquisitive related or personal related information about me. I've always said, ask any question you want. I will always feel free to answer it because I have absolutely no filter. So, <laughs> um, what do you got, Sally? Make it good. People are okay. some serious cheese may. Okay, so because we're talking about patients and how they how patients are, what kind of patient would you consider yourself? Terrible. I would be the worst patient yes. on the planet. A hundred percent. A hundred what? Hey, hey, hey. hey, hey. Tell them yeah. about the Botox. Well, I mean, <laughs> I mean Botox is bullshit. I'd be the worst patient for a number of reasons. And I actually use myself as an example of what patients ought not to be in order to be successful. So I am critical. I am particular. I am demanding. I am um, fastidious. And those are all great qualities in your surgeon. (laughs) Terrible qualities in a patient. Because what ends up happening is that personality, which by the way, you can't turn off. It's not like it's really good here, so uh, it's working for me. I'm a, a physicist or engineer, and here I'm going to just act like it's not there. It, it just doesn't work that way. And yes. so when your result is done, you're going to micromanage the outcome. And right. you will 100% focus on the 3.5% of your outcome that is not good and totally ignore the 96.5% of your outcome that's excellent. And right. that is a shitty patient and I would be a shitty patient. As a result, I would never, ever, ever get anything done because I would be unhappy and make my surgeon kill himself. <laughs> what that- if you could do anything though, what would you consider? If nothing. You- nothing. Really? No. no. So this is interesting because patients, you know, we always get patients asking me silly right. questions like, and they'd say, okay, well, have you had anything done? And I'd be All like, right. if I had anything done, I'd want my money back. <laughs> right, because obviously this is a shitty result. Like, oh, someone asked me if I had my nose, and I was like, "Right, is this a joke? My nose, if my nose was done, this guy should be fired. This is malpractice. <laughs> what are you talking about?" Yeah. So the answer is, has I have I had anything done? No, I mean Botox. I obviously have it done um, uh, every few months or so, but no, I've not had anything done. I'm obviously not opposed to it. Duh, and. The question was, if you could do anything, what would it be? And the answer is nothing, because you only do the things that bother you. Right. And nothing really bothers me, right. because it just doesn't. It doesn't mean I'm secure and I'm not insecure. It's just nothing physically bothers me. And the third is, if anyone could, if you had to do something, who would you pick? 
to do it? And the answer is no one. I don't trust anyone. And that's why I'm a bad patient. Patient, Because yeah. the very nature of being a patient is a leap of faith. You close your eyes, you go to sleep, you wake up and you're different. And you had no say in it. I mean, what the F? There is no <laughs> way. I, I won't even let anyone design my office, let alone rearrange my face. Yeah, which that's an, oh, we got to talk about that too. Um, a little bit more about you. Um, I want to know. I want to know. I'm well, Persian. I already you know, but I think a lot of pe people. I'm Persian. <laughs> I'm from Iran. I moved here when I was three and a half. We had an Islamic revolution. I'm Jewish. We escaped. We moved to Westwood, where all the other J Persian Jews moved. I've lived in LA my whole life, with the exception Maybe. of four years in San Diego. I'm as okay. Los, Los Angelino as possible. And uh, yeah, what do you want? Hold on, hold on, Doug. Okay, where'd you learn Spanish? In La Calle. And That's... dad, right? Your dad? No, I learned, no, that was a joke. That means I learned Spanish in the streets. <laughs> I didn't learn Spanish in the streets. I learned Spanish uh, in high school. Right. High school. Right. Yeah, yeah. Do all the mission trips. Well, I mean, listen, I was a high schooler, like everybody else is a high schooler. Right. You have to pick a language. And I had at the time a a French counselor. I'll, I don't even remember my friend's names that I've known for 50 years, but somehow I remember this asshole's name. His name is Mr. Jacquard. It's probably, I don't know, somewhere. I don't know. Anyways, <laughs> so my dad and I came up to readers and we were uh, picking classes. And he's like, okay, architecture, got it. Math, got it, blah, blah, blah. He's like, language, French. He had already filled me in for French. And my dad's like, oh, French? Gosh. What the hell is he going to learn French for? He's like, what do you mean? It's a beautiful language. French is French is the language of uh, the yeah. aristocrat, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> my dad's like, no, 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 no. And my dad had self-taught himself Spanish. Right. And my dad is like, might as well be Mexican. And he's like, no, 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 you got to put my son in Spanish. None of this French crap. So he put me in Spanish, which is a no brainer. You're in right. Montana. Right. And as a result, as a result, I learned four years of Spanish, much like everybody else. Right. For whatever reason, I had a strong affinity for it. And then when I went to college, then med school, then residency, I ended up using it a ton. Left and right, right. Right, because we're in Southern California where the population is 50% Spanish speaking. Right. And I was a translator on the, on the wards and I was like this and that. And it has served me, I mean, second to math yeah. in terms of its usefulness. And I have a tremendous affinity, love, appreciation for the Latino culture. That is all of it. Central, South, the whole shebang, because they are very... Food. I love the food. I love Thai I food. I don't speak Thai, but <laughs> it wasn't the food. It was that the people are lovely, and it's incredibly useful. Right. And as a result, then it triggered the ability to do all these mission trips in all these countries. I don't know, El Salvador, uh, Mexico. You everywhere. Cuba, Guatemala five times, four times. Uruguay, why? Yeah. Uruguay, et cetera. So yes, Spanish is a huge part of my personal life, my medical career, and a lot of, you know, uh, a big part of everything that I do. If you weren't a plastic surgeon, though, what was your backup? Remember? Of course I remember. What do you mean? I do it every day. If I was a plastic know, surgeon, it's I would funny. have been- I don't think I'm, people I'm, realize you were going to do this. It's if I was a plastic surgeon, I'd be an architect. No brainer. I mean, it's like a, it's a, it, actually I was on the way to becoming an architect. And then I met some guy and like most people who are young, it really takes one person to make you go left and one person to make you ro go right. right. And so like when people come to me and they're like, could you talk to my son yes. or my daughter? <laughs> I, I really want them to be a doctor. I think they should talk to you. I was like, no, no, no. You don't want them talking to me. I will send them the exact opposite direction. <laughs> So I think when you're influenceable, um, influenceable, and someone talks to you, they can move you in a direction. So I spoke to some guy who was an architect. He was miserable. He told me he was miserable. I don't think that was the only reason, but it was a definite consideration of mine. But I love space, design, um, building, uh, 
uh, physics. I just love it all. And right. plastic surgery is exactly all that, except instead of working with like steel and wood and stone, you work with bones, tendons, ligaments, and muscle. You are right. building stuff. You need to understand three-dimensional spatial relationships. Right. And you need to have an eye for angles and things coming together. So yeah. it's all that, just a different product. Right. Which you, I'm, I'm not sure how many people know this, but you've designed the office we're currently in and you've designed the office we're going to, which we're really excited about, and the surgery center because we're going to have our own surgery center. Super mm -hmm. excited. Yeah. And it looks amazing. I yeah, I listen, I, I mean, obviously, it's something mm -hmm. that I'm like a closet yeah. architect. So uh, any project I can, whether that be our office, the new office, the surgery center, my home, whenever I have an opportunity to get really into it, I do. And I take great joy in it. I love it so much. And the way you are in surgery with measuring, by the way, this is a fun fact. He loves <laughs> you. You had to hang all the pictures in our office and they were measured. It had to be centered. It had to be like. Yeah. I mean, but it's all the same. I mean, listen, correct. anything that is anything that needs to be accurate, the word accurate means it can't be good enough. Accurate. It needs to be specifically, it needs to be just right. Requires right. numbers. You can't right. eyeball shit. You got to be accurate. It isn't cooking. Cooking is not accurate. Right. right. Cooking is like, this is more or less a tablespoon. Right. 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 Mm -hmm. but you can't do that when you're doing physics or architecture or the wall is sort of straight. No, it's not straight. It's either straight or not straight. It's not. Right. So um, naturally, the, those qualities are going to be beneficial in things. And I, you know, obviously, if I want to hang a bunch of pictures, I need them to be straight. <laughs> <laughs> and otherwise, it'll drive me nuts. Oh, I know. Yeah. I mean, you, you got a nail and hammer ready. And also, so that leads to you, how you do your body markings, which are super important to you. It takes yeah. a lot of time. It's it's very tedious, but that's what makes you... Well, you mark twice, cut once. Uh, mark twice, okay. cut once. That's what's an a old saying. Like, you want to make sure your markings, because at the end of the day, you mark, mark, you measure, 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 mark, whatever. Right. And then... You just cut on those measurements. So whatever you measured, and then remember when we operate on people, we operate on them what? Lying down. Right. When we mark you, you're standing up. Standing, correct. Right, so you don't, you do a belly, they're laying down, we look at your belly when you're standing up. You could breast, you mark them standing because that's what you look at, but you're laying down. Same thing with nose and everything. So your markings have to be on the money. Because you can't figure it out on the table because it doesn't look right because you're laying down. So, yes. Right. I think and if you, if you guys get a chance to see that, I mean, you look at it and you're like, how is that going to look? It's it's crazy. Like when you do yeah. a breast reduction and you're holding the breast. Like, that's yeah. insane. Yeah. yeah. Especially yeah. relationships is very important. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, cars, dog. <laughs> what about my cars? What about your cars? Tell everybody what you like. I like, uh, I don't like cars. I like vintage cars. Vintage. I don't like watches. I like vintage watches. I I don't know if it's midlife crisis. I don't know if I'm trying to recapture my youth. <laughs> I like, I like old shit um, because it's one off, right? So if I had $100,000 and I could buy, I could walk into Rolex and go buy a Rolex or if I had $100,000 and I had to hunt for a Paul Newman, one of 20 uh, 1970 Rolex, I'd rather have the Paul Newman because it's limited. Not everyone can have it. You can't just walk and go get it. And it's special. Right. If it's you and me and any other, any other jackass can go get it, it loses its uniqueness, its specialty. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's just an object. And right. so I like vintage cars. I love Porsches because I like the way they're manufactured. I like their attention to detail. Um, they're they're 
a beautiful, beautiful car. And what I love about cars is I love the beauty of the cars. So I like, right. I like collecting them because there's some, and then I love the nostalgia of it. Because right. these are cars that I um, remember right. in elementary school and in high school and in college because it spanned the 80s and 90s. Right. Uh, 90% of my cars were 80s and 90s because that was an era in which I would dream or I would wish as a child. And now I'm a grown ass man and I can. Then I would wish and now I can. So they have a great deal of um, meaning and sentiment for me because these are things that I always wish I could have had when I was kid. Right. Now I can have them. And so I don't really, I'm not interested in modern day vehicles and modern day stuff. Yeah. What about hobbies? I know you, you used to play basketball. I mean, I had hobbies. I'm not going to lie to you. I don't, you know, I loved basketball because I played in high school. I loved. But well, we need your hands. Yeah. yeah. No, I think you know, people say that. I don't, I don't, I'm not going to. Yeah. Obviously, if I broke my wrist, we'd be fucked <laughs> because, you know, I wouldn't be able to operate. If we can't right. operate, I can't make a living. If I can't make a living, I'm screwed. So, yes, it isn't some like just sing, right? If I was an internal medicine doctor, I could be just fine without my wrist in a cast. It'd be fine. But if I have to operate, I can't. So yes, that's true. But I used to love basketball. I just, I just don't have, I'm not in shape enough on a regular basis. I did a bunch of triathlons because someone sort of dared me and I'm, I mean, I'm reasonably competitive. I used to do cycling. I don't do cycling much anymore. Um, yeah, I remember we went to cheer you on for the triathlon. Yeah, you ate it. <laughs> yeah, there was a there was some guy that I used to hang out with a lot. Yeah, I used to ride. With I, well, so I used to ride with him. I used to ride um, a road bike, one of those street bike, a Lance Armstrong type of bike. Yeah, and I was at best average. In order to be great at something, whatever, you need to put in a lot of man hours. Right. Or you need to be incredibly gifted from God. So clearly I wasn't incredibly gifted from God and I would have need to put hundred man hours, which I wasn't doing. So I would week ride on the weekends, that kind of weekend warrior. Right. This guy and I are riding and he's done an Iron Man. So he's like legit. I don't know. I was talking to him or something and he's like, yeah, you should do one of these like <laughs> triathlons, like these, uh, they're called sprint triathlons for the right. uh there's a uh, sprint tries olympic tries half iron man and iron man so each increment becomes exponentially more difficult right right so a sprint try is like theoretically attainable for most people that are in shape it requires biking running and swimming right so i do not run <laughs> and i do not swim and I barely bike. <laughs> so we're dry riding and he's like, yeah, you should do one of these. You're uh, really easy. Blah, blah. I was like, no, 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 just no way. And next thing you know, he's like, I got an email. You've been signed up for the Hermosa <laughs> Tron. I was like, what the fuck? And it was like a month. And he signed me up for the triathlon in a month. And I'm, not that it's competitive, but I felt super obligated because this guy sort of went on a limb for me. Right. So I don't know, I started trying to swim and try to run and and I didn't really want to tell a lot of people because I wasn't sure if I would make it because you got to swim in the ocean. I don't right. I remember really swim in a pool. I had a wetsuit, <laughs> the whole shebang. I actually did a little I did it. Yeah, I did. It was on my bucket list. And uh, I did a whole bunch of those, like five of those. And then yeah, that was the end of that. So, well, yeah, uh, I mean, I haven't had a chance to do a lot of those things, obviously, as I've gotten older, as I've gotten busier, and now I have the greatest hobby on the planet, which is in my, being taking care of my son and spending time with my family. So you got to, you, you got to, you got to give to get. There's only so much absolutely. minutes in a day. And, uh, yeah. How do you like, how do you like being a, a new dad and hubby? So, um, I, I, my son is a, you know, I think this is, I, I get it. There are certain he's things. One, he's, right now he's one. Yeah, he's just a little over one. He started yeah. walking 
As a matter of fact, he face planted today and hit something, and it's got a hu huge bruise under his left eye. So, uh, yeah, yeah, he's he's like he walks like a drunk person. So, um, I think there are certain things in life that you just can't explain. Yeah, you can't describe. You must just experience. And while I always envisioned, imagined, I have nieces, nephews, friends, kids, blah, blah, blah. All of those are amazing. And they obviously serve as a sort of as an idea. Right. Until I had him. Right. And until he became, I don't know, eight months, nine months, a real human interacting, showing you affection, recognizing you, responding yeah. to you. Yeah. You just don't recognize or imagine the amount of love that you have within you for a being okay. or creature. Uh, and so it is a very special, unique experience that it may not be for everyone, but for those who have experienced it, they right understand it. And it has to be that way because right. in order for humans to exist, your urge to have a child and protect that child has to be greater than your urge to enjoy your own life selfishly. Otherwise, there'd be no humans, right? Because right. we would end with our generation. So it's right. baked into us as is eating, as is sleeping. You don't right. think about it. You just do it. So um, it was the final chapter of my life that was just eluding me. I'm almost 50. But uh, yeah, I made it. Uh, it, it is fantastic. Yay. I have All right. One more question, you have one more question for me? All right. I have one more, one more. All right. Make it, it is, a good one. It is. When you look at someone, do you think of doing plastic surgery on them? <laughs> every, every single human being I see um, at all times, yeah. I recognize, I see all of the things that can or could be changed yeah. it is not a trait you turn off right when you are a michelin rated chef and you spend 365 days of the year refining your palate so you could pick up on the finest of tastes you cannot go over to your friend's house eat dinner and not know that they put too much salt in the food. You may right. not say anything, but you can't act like you didn't notice it. You cannot tell me that if you are a concert pianist, you don't know a piano is out of tune. Right. You but... know it. You don't say it. So right. yes, every time I see someone, my brain, which is trained, will recognize or notice the things that are imbalanced or can be improved. But that doesn't change. First of all, I don't blurt it out. <laughs> hey, nice to meet you. Wow, wouldn't you look better? <laughs> so I don't do that because that's right. uh, not nice. <laughs> that's terrible. And it doesn't alter my affection, connection, love for them. It's right. a it's abstract, factual, like that blue is a nicer shade than that blue. Right. It just is. Right. I don't, that's why when people are like, oh, you got to love yourself and plastic surgery, you're insecure. It's all this nonsense. And I don't agree with that at all. You can be kumbaya, super holistic, vegan, blah, 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 and be completely insecure, miserable, and hate yourself. And you could have had four surgeries and think you walk on water. It's right. unrelated. Right. All we're talking about is taking something that's short, making it long, something that's crooked, making it straight. And it, what it does is it, it, in certain people, it makes you feel better about yourself and high five. But to answer your question, yes. You're always on. I'm always You on. just don't say anything. Correct. Right. And that would be to expect from anyone who's trained themselves to do anything. They yeah. never turn it off. Right. You can't. Right. No, Sally, I don't see anything wrong with you. <laughs> you better watch it. <laughs> All right. You see? Hopefully that answered a whole bunch of questions you guys are asking or wondering. If it hadn't, we are going to open it up to, I think we'll do a once in a quarter, ask me whatever. 
right? We'll make a ask me whatever segment. Send me questions, guys. And I am pretty damn transparent in open books because there's not much that I am afraid of or ashamed of or regret. At any rate, first and foremost, Chacon, thank you for finally getting on the show with us. It's been a pleasure to have you. You did a great job. I know you were having a heart attack as to how to <laughs> go. I think it's safe to say we give you an A+. Plus. Thank um, you. And as always, thank you all for joining us on this episode of Plastic Surgery Uncensored. Um, I hope you enjoyed the show. If you do and you listen, do me a favor because the show will not exist without the following requests. One, share it with people you love. People you're like, hey, this might be good for you. You might consider it. You think people are not going to do plastic surgery. Next thing you know, they look like Quasimodo. And you're like, what did you do? Oh, I wouldn't have got this done. Why didn't you tell me? Oh, I don't know. I just kept it myself. So you never know who's going to do what. So you want to share this with the people you love. And download it and subscribe because that's how we know you exist. And lastly... If you like the show, write something nice. Because at the end of the day, we live in a society where all we do is if we write anything, it's usually something negative. So if you love the show, we always appreciate any kind of feedback. And if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it. Okay, guys, until next week, I'm your host, Dr. Roddy Ravon, signing off. <laughs>